Hey, look, it's time for bringing in troops from quarantine little Zoom show. How's everybody doing? There's David Thorpe. Very excited today. We're joined by esteemed guests Louisa Thomas and Mary Poulon. How are you? Good. Thanks for having us. So you guys just wrote this book or edited this book, um, Losers. And you actually proudly call yourself Losers. I had, kind of had the urge to be like, oh, we got a couple of losers on the show. <laughs> um, I'm going to read your bios really fast. Uh, Mary is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Monopolists and The Kevin Show. She contributes to The New Yorker, Esquire, MSNBC, Vice, and Politico. She's been a staff reporter for The New York Times and Wall Street Journal and was an NBC sports producer at the 2016 Olympics. Louisa Thomas is a staff writer at The New Yorker and the author of Louisa, The Extraordinary Life of Mrs. Adams and Conscience, Two Soldiers, Two Pacifists, One Family, A Test of Will and Faith in World War I. She's a former writer and editor of ESPN's Grantland, where she wrote an incredible story about Nets executive Irina Pavlova and a former fellow at New America. Her writing has appeared in The New York Times, Vogue, The Wall Street Journal, The New Yorker, The Paris Review, and other places. Um, I love the concept of this book. Uh, sports get so breathless and like championship focused and everything. And this just sort of doesn't go there at all. What got you excited about, about, about a book about losers? Oh, good question. Um, Lisa, please help fill in the gaps here. I mean, to be honest about it, we both got laid off from sports writing gigs that we really loved. And so it was like loss was this thing, you know, that was like in our lives. And so I think at least for me, that's why I've, I've always been drawn to losing stories and my family's had a lot of deaths. And so we just felt like this was a reality. And I can't remember, I think we were getting coffee and I was just like, God, I'm trying to pitch all these loser stories. And like editors, like we have this pro winner bias in our sports coverage, even though losing is a part of life. And so I kind of came out of, came out of there. We've always been kind of loser advocates. <laughs> <laughs> I think my connection to losing goes way, way beyond, way earlier um, than even, you know, Grant Land closing. I feel like um, growing up in high school, I was, I was the player. I could be up, you know, we played like, I played tennis and we played, you know, 10 game pro sets and I could be up, you know, 7-0. And I just knew somewhere <laughs> like losing was this like little demon in the corner, you know, guiding my balls like, just wide, you know, and there was a sort of sense that I it was always sort of, it was like an inescapable part of, of being an athlete. And I think actually sports is a really interesting context to lose, think about losing because um, on the one hand, like it's so clear, the stakes are so clear, they're winners and they're losers. On the other hand, um, you know, as every athlete knows, you know, even, even those people who never lose, um, you know, in the, in the kind of elite athlete sense, like they're, they're just go from win to win. Um, you only get better when you lose. Like you only get better when you're failing, when you're practicing things like that. So there this, there's this way in which like winning and losing is always intertwined. It's always been interesting to me, but I, I've always ha kind of been drawn to the, the person standing next to the winner as opposed to the winner. I've always had a sort of um, somewhat soft spot, maybe like projection identification, but um, yeah. So when Mary mentioned, um, you know, that, you know, she's been really trying to kind of put forward these loser stories and it's not getting not getting a lot of traffic um or attention i was like absolutely these are these are the stories that need to be told let's do it <laughs> it's funny you mentioned high school i'm actually in eugene oregon my hometown helping my dad downsize and i found all my fourth place track ribbons <laughs> i love it <laughs> that's Plus awesome and i just and they were tucked away in like the the bowels of an attic of a garage, like clearly like packed away where like no one, there was no wall of fame for my athletic career as a kid. And I, when I, I found them just like a week ago, I was like, oh my God, this was it. Like I've been obsessed since I was a kid. So fourth place, especially in the Olympics or something like track and field is the worst. worst. You're not even on the podium. You have to watch the other three people who beat you. Uh, anyway. So I was excited to find this loser artifact, which makes a perfect bookmark. Maybe I can sell it on eBay. <laughs> <laughs> it's still, it's still great prop to have. It's I also just did, really interesting though, if you, ahead, Mary, you know, turn up this research, you know, it, there's some research to show that the bronze medalists at the Olympics are the happiest. So the most satisfied with how they did. I mean, that, you know, and one of the things we tried to get into is the idea that just because you win doesn't mean you're not a loser in some ways, <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there are sort of costs associated with winning too. Right. Um, so That's kind of sticking the knife in Mary's fourth place, though. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fourth place winners are just losers. <laughs> we, got, we got a book out of it, guys. It's okay. <laughs> um, there's a moment in the first story is about um, Charles Bach, I think is how you say his last name. Um, grew up just a basketball obsessed with big basketball dreams and 
then he gets his parents to get him a membership to an athletic club where legit NBA prospect players in Las Vegas come and play. And he sort of earns some credibility with Lloyd Daniels, who's a legend. And basically there's a moment where Lloyd's like, hey, are you playing? And he just kind of bonks. He just kind of, <laughs> he's like, no, I gotta, I gotta go to work. And I was like, oh, and then that would have been the pinnacle of his athletic career. And he just didn't quite, he just didn't say, yeah. I was, who can't relate to that? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I felt bad for him and I kind of knew it was going to come and I still felt I really was hoping he would say yes because he really wanted to play in that he, bigger really game. Wants to play. he just couldn't do it I mean I know in a way though it's still the pinnacle of us <laughs> this athletic career you know yeah. in some ways like it's it's that moment that he returns to you know again and again you know is, is the kind of the chance he never took and I do think like lo losing in some of those is what sharpens your focus a little like that moment to me felt a little like all these moments of life like you know if you ask someone to marry you or or all these stupid prom conversations or breaking up all these sort of moments of like you have to actually do the thing right and like maybe he didn't get that one but maybe it sharpens you a little for a different one um yeah it's also a dance about risk, right? And we're living in this really interesting moment right now in terms of risk. And yeah, yeah. we really, I think, especially in America, love to valorize people who take these big risks and sports has so much swagger to it. And, you know, you put everything on the line to pursue something. And then, like, most of the time, I mean, what's crazy about the Olympics in particular, and you see this in person and you don't see it on TV, is most people lose, especially like track and field, right? Like, most people, like, you have thousands of athletes and then you watch the, they don't air this on NBC all the time but like heat after heat and the place it's like award shows like the reason award shows I think shift about halfway through is four to five people the Oscars don't win and they're just sitting in their seats and they want to go to the bar and like the Olympics has a similar thing too where most people lose and then they're just like swept off the broadcast <laughs> like shoved back into the Olympic park and I and I you know, at the, you see that in person, the U S open, I think is very similar, right? Cause of that tournament style. Like, so it's, it's more common and yet we still don't talk about it. Yeah. Those heats, <laughs> like the track heats, right? It's like, Oh, yeah. people, just go. I think that story though is an interesting. And, and one of the reasons I think we wanted to start about that. I think that risk you're, you're right. is a really important element of this. And Lloyd Daniels is himself like a, a cautionary tale in a lot of yeah. ways thinking about risk. And Las Vegas is very much a character. The city of Las Vegas is very much a character in that story. And it's, it doesn't always cut, you know, it doesn't always cut so cleanly, you know, who's the hero here? Like who made, who makes the right decisions? Who, you know, what are the kind of priorities that we're, we're, um, you know, endorsing and things like that. I mean, I, I I think that that's a really complicated and interesting and rich story partly because of all those dynamics at work you know and there is this moment where it's very clearly like ah oh, dude get on the court like don't you know skip work whatever but but in a lot of ways that's in the context of the story where there's a lot there are a lot of you know a lot of wrong decisions being made and a lot of risks that are being taken that are you know you are tragic in other ways what, what i took from it uh, as someone i study i'm a coach for basketball but i I like to study uh, entertainers and learn from them and comedians. I've read uh, many years ago, I read Bob Woodward's book on John Belushi called Wired. And then uh, many years later, tragically, I read the, like the best biography about Chris Farley. Both, rem when I read your story about Lloyd Daniels, I thought of both of those men, those very talented men who are dead. They didn't just lose, they're lost forever. And they were both in situations where when they could, if someone could have interceded and made him deal with some short-term sacrifice, like let's get out of entertaining for a while and go live in the mountains or somewhere and work on your addiction problems. They just kept on being fed what they wanted to be fed because everyone else got fed too. They're all, you know, everyone making movies with them made their money. And I thought of that when I reading about Lloyd Daniels, those single last place he ever should have allowed to go was Las Vegas. Go to Vermont. There's lots of places he could have gone to. Where there's nothing around. And he'd have been forced to deal with his demons and either figure it out or not. But it wouldn't have been so easy to be distracted. And so when I think about losing, again, as a coach, normally it takes a team to create losers. It's not just one person. It's a group of bad decisions, creating more risk, and then we ultimately have our losers. Well, you're also, I think the parallel between sports and entertainment is like the public nature of this, right? Like so, most of us, when we fail or lose, it's in private and it still stinks. I'm not saying that it's like pleasant, but like when you lose a championship, it's like an entire city, like 
that sticks with you and you're known as that forever and ever and ever. And with entertainment too, if you screw up. So I've always been blown away watching athletes do that, like just live their, you know, your vulnerabilities, like your guts are just like splayed out on the court or the field in a way that like, you know, a, a, you know, a non-famous person's breakup wouldn't be inherently. Right. And that's like a different level of chess that I totally <laughs> can't say I play, you know? There's um when Judy put the Amazon link up for a second, um, I noticed that um, people who bought this book also bought White Fragility. I don't know if you saw Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> um, <what's the> <laughs> uh, maybe you scroll down. There you go. Wow. Yeah. So Amazing. Do a little brain processing on that. What do you <laughs> look at that? <laughs> One thing that I, I thought too, uh, we... I haven't read your whole book. I plan to because I think we don't contact losing the way we should. It, it, it should not be, other, other than when the minor disappointment or major disappointment you feel temporarily, it shouldn't be a moniker that sticks with you forever. And Because in reality, and this is something I argue with all the time with today's world, it's mostly uh, conservatives who think the, you know, the fourth place ribbons are, are ruining America. Everyone gets a ribbon. Mm -hmm. And as someone who is literally in that <laughs> Only business. Only Mary's house. <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm literally in the business and a father of two that played when well, my son played sports. Uh, I, I liked the trophies for everyone and the ribbons for everyone. Because to me, the whole idea is to get young people to fall in love with the sport or the activity. And if you place so much emphasis on winning and losing, you're going to lose everyone but the few winners at the end of each season. That's not how we build a talent pool to see who the next great players are. You want to get as many people to fall in love with the sport because losing does hurt. And if you don't love the sport, you'll stop working. Why would you work and keep losing? You wouldn't unless you're in love. David so, actually did a super great thing. When his kids were little, they played sports they were bad at. So they would be better teammates when they played sports they were good at. Which I that's think cool. Good. A big, a big yeah. part of playing a team sport is being a teammate. In fact, I think it's the most yeah. important thing is uh, I used to tell my son, you'll be sleeping out by the pool tonight if I don't see you, you know, high-fiving the young guy on your team that struck out or walked a few guys. Like, if you're not what doing kind of that, you're not- What that? Everybody likes sleeping by the pool. <laughs> yeah, I, I said, you're not welcome in my home if you can't think about your teammates. That wasn't totally serious, but he wasn't sure. <laughs> he was six or seven or eight, whatever. <laughs> I like that he knew I valued that so much. You, losing is, is, it doesn't just inform us. In many cases, it builds our character. But it has to start from a place of real passion for something. If we place so much emphasis on winning and we don't win when we're young, we'll just move on to something else, which happens all the time. Kids quit all the time doing it. Every acting, uh, Henry's daughter is, a, is an accomplished actress and loves it. And I don't, think, I don't think she probably kills it every time she performs, but she's in love. She can't stop doing it. She's not a loser, David. Of course she does. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mary, can I put you on the spot and have you tell us the story of the tomato can from Michigan? Yeah, <laughs> what the, it's what a weird the crazy story. Uh, so once upon a time in a town called Gladwin, Michigan. Uh, so I had spent, let me back up. I, I've been interested in mixed martial arts for years. And this was back in 2013. So there was a lot of legal ambiguity about, particularly in New York, um, you know, where and how, you know, every state has different regulations. Um, UFC obviously has continued to grow and explode. And I was just so curious about like, who's the, who's, who's watching this? What's the audience? Who's getting into this? And um, so anytime I would travel for a story, I would go to whatever the local cage fight was. And it could be here in Oregon. It could be in Oklahoma. I went all over just kind of as like an addendum because they were sprouting up all over and they were sometimes in like granges or, you know, backyards and sometimes these huge professional kind of Vegas style events. And so um, I, I was on staff at the Times at the time, and my editor walks over and he goes, hey, there's this like police blotter report in Michigan that this mixed martial artist fighter faked his own death. And apparently he faked it, so it's not real. Can you go find out what's going on? And I was like, uh, like, you know, I'll try. And so I started calling around and I found like jilted promoters, people that threw these benefit fights for him. One guy even claimed to have gone to his memorial service and yet, like, the court said the guy was in jail. So I was like, this is really confusing. I'm not getting what I need to. So I flew to Michigan. Gladwin, Michigan's a town of about 3,000 people, like, in the little hand. It's, like, right in the middle. And I went to the courthouse. And sure enough, there's this guy, Charles Rowe, and the fighter. And he was brought out in front of me. So I was like, okay, I've seen it with my own eyes. I can confirm he is indeed alive. So that's a starting point. 
craft journalism, right? Um, <laughs> and, you know, at, at the courthouse were all these characters. Like, there was a woman sitting next to me who was sobbing. And I just, you know, said, hi, how are you? And that was his mother. So I started reporting from there and kind of unspooled his whole life and what had happened. So he was, uh, so, so tomato can is a boxing term, actually. And it's the guy you throw in the ring to get beat up. Um, you know, the, the basically like the practice human, for lack of a better term. And that's kind of what he was in this world of Michigan mixed martial arts. He never had won. He was kind of out of shape. Um, and then on the side, you know, he was trying to make money doing this. He was also trafficking drugs and needed money. And then, you know, the story kind of gets this Bonnie and Clyde episode where he fakes his own death because he owes this guy a lot of money and he owes all these fight promoters money and the walls are closing in. So he and Rosa, his girlfriend, um, stick up a gun store run by this elderly man named Richard Robinette. Um, while wearing a Batman mask, he hits him over the head, I believe with a hammer, and then flees. And um, it's a small town. So the fact that he hit out and thought he was dead the whole time is pretty impressive. And then it turns out there was a memorial service. It was in someone's living room and he was in the attic the entire time. So he's one of the few humans ever to like hear his own service. Wow. And it was like very Tom Sawyer, right? Is it yeah. Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn where that happened? Right. So um, he gets caught and he was in prison. And so the way I reported the story is I, you know, he ultimately agreed to talk to me. And he had these like, I don't know if you've ever, you know, talked to people in prison on the phone. They have these, like, they have these very discreet 20 minute blocks often or restricted access. So for weeks I would just call him and then I actually had to go back and get more reporting. And I just thought it was this really weird window into not like this guy like he had a dream like he really thought he was going to be this great fighter but it just wasn't going to happen and going to these fights in michigan what people were getting out of mma and these scrappy you know and it was yeah, at one point i was sitting by a cage watching a match and all this blood spattered on my notebook and i was like all right like I, i'm i'm in the scene i'm here and so you know I, and as somebody who grew up in like a rural community that kind of dark Coen Brothers-y thing, that environment, you know, the same way we were talking about Vegas being a character yeah. in Ryan's piece, you know, like that's how I felt about Michigan. And I now actually have a, a lot of family in Michigan and how dark and kind of gothic almost his whole story was. So yeah, it's a weird one. Wow. So is that <laughs> one of those, like you take a lesson from the lost kind of stories from the book or, you know what I mean? Like, is there a, is there a yeah. hard <laughs> like, Well, I mean, the obvious one is like crime doesn't pay, right? Like he nearly could have killed this guy, Richard Robinette. And like, and also just that you can't, I mean, I, I think about this story all the time. Like there's something about like, he was so desperate to escape his own life, you know, like that, that he wanted to start anew and fresh. And there was something about that, that I think, you know, we can make fun of, but I think there's also a fantasy to that, to some, you know, to some degree that people depending on what their circumstances are. And he had an incredible amount of trauma in his childhood and his background that, you know, is also in that story, that there was something very universal to me about that, that just a desire when things get bad to just want to start over, you know? And, and that I felt like was something I've heard, seen, like I've never seen it so dramatic as that, if that makes sense. Just to be fair though, if you're going to do that, you're probably better off not running away to your attic. <laughs> Correct, yes. <laughs> I've read yes. a couple of books about it shockingly yeah. locked within like a few square miles, right? Like he has the, the narrative of escape, but he never goes <laughs> anywhere. <laughs> it's a Let big world out there. For all of us, yes. <laughs> they talk about like New Mexico or something, right? It's like the fantasy, but it's like, you guys have to go to New Mexico. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, yeah they, didn't get, they didn't get out of the state lines. But, um, but again, it's like that fantasy, that dream, if only, if only. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's a little of a quarantine fantasy, right? We're like, I get that. I mean, I go to the grocery store, it feels like a safari. I'm like, wow, this is incredible. So <laughs> things have changed. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter's um uh, David mentioned her already, but um she's sixteen, she's just starting to drive and and you know, we basically had her locked up the whole time and now she's basically we, occasionally we let her go with us to the grocery store and she's like super excited about it. And I'm like, Oh, that's pathetic. <laughs> like, that's, you need to have more fun. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about the pandemic. Um, so, uh, David, David, on this show last time, David launched a little theory that your book kind of applies to, which is that like America is a, an NBA lottery pick that could totally still prove to be a bust. Like, needs some good coaching. You know, it needs to yeah. play. <laughs> we're not sure yet if we're any yeah. good or not. We got a chance. You got a ceiling. Yeah. Right, like, <laughs> yeah. You're a Wizards fan, Marie Hachimura. 
has a chance yeah. to be pretty good. There's no guarantee. I'm yeah. really worried yeah. this week. There's Look no the guarantee he's gonna make it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He's got a chance. He's got potential. Um, Louisa, I, this is a minor point, but um, your name is Louisa. You wrote a book about a Louisa, and then there's another Louisa in here. Perceptive. <laughs> Are you going to keep finding Louisas? Like, do you have another? Uh, uh, well, once I do, you know, they're really close. Like, so this Louisa that's the author in this book is also the, the godmother of my daughter. Like, <laughs> really, you know, once I find a Louisa, you know. <laughs> You're you know. on. Um, yeah, no, she's, um, she's actually one of my best friends from um, my freshman year in college, you know, all the way until now, so. Awesome. Did you have like a Louisa centric meeting? Is that how you became friends? We actually were mixed up frequently with each other our freshman year. You know, as pe everyone was going around and, you know, people would actually assume they'd already, we look a little bit alike. We look probably less alike now than we did back then. But um, we, and actually her dad was my dad's English teacher in <laughs> high school, weirdly enough. Um, so we had all these kind of like weird connections and, um, like my, I mean, it, it gets even more kind of involved in that. But um, yeah, so we were sort of kind of stuck together, um, whether we wanted to be or not. And then we ended up, um, you know, we had the same thesis advisor, we <laughs> had the same major, I lived with her sister when I took a semester off and went to Ireland, like we were just kind of, you know. Um, we're basically family at this point. Basically, um, so yeah. Um, so yeah, she's, but it also turns out that she's an extraordinarily, talented writer she was also the second best squash player in the country wow um so she's an athlete herself so knows something something about losing and yeah. and winning as well i i don't know if i'm the only one uh, who feel this way but my one of my favorite things is hearing women talk about their best friend from their freshman year of college like <laughs> on day one very often they meet and they're still sister 30 40 years later guys don't have as many of those stories at least in my experience but my best friend in, in college was my, is my second cousin. Her name is Lynn. And her very first day on campus, she met a girl named Karen. They were roommates, so they met. And we're 55 now, all of us. In fact, I mean, Karen's 56. She's the oldest of us. And her and Lynn are absolutely sisters. And my daughter knows the story. And she's starting school in nine days, 10 days. We take her to school for college. And she's already met a girl that she's not a roommate. But they've been communicating, because you can do that on social media now. And she thinks this might be like my longtime Lynn and Karen story. Like <laughs> I want it to happen for her. You guys have so many that have similar stories like that. Yeah. Uh, that we just don't have as much. You guys are just stupid. We yeah. <laughs> that's a recurring theme on our show. Guys in conclusion. <laughs> we are, we have yeah. problems. Um you uh, okay, so we've talked about losers quite a lot. And then I read uh, Louisa, your New Yorker story that I think came out yesterday. Um, which is like the total opposite story, right? Like, uh, I'm going to try to say properly the last name of Neka Ogwumake. Ogwumake? Ogwumake? Um, we, we, she's almost a doctor, right? Like, she doesn't miss shots when she plays basketball. <laughs> she, <wins laughs> games, she negotiates CBAs. Like, what the heck? Can we just put her in charge of everything now? It seems like we just, why, why wait for the delay for her to like be president or whatever? I know. Why, why wait till she gets to be 35? Like we yeah. might as well, you know. Um, all of her sisters too? Like what the yeah, heck? Yeah, I mean, that's actually, the, that's one of the things that attracted me to her story in the first place. Um, you know, at first I became interested in her this winter, um, you know, when I heard about the new collective bargaining agreement and I mean, she was the president of the Players Association. And then it turns out her sister, who is also a number one draft pick, also on the Sparks, also on the executive committee. And, but one of the things that's really interesting when you talk to them is Neka is very reserved, like very controlled, very um, eloquent, but like in a very sort of um, very methodical way. And Shanae is very bubbly. I mean, she's very unlike her. She projects a very sort of different personality and yet they have very similar trajectories. So that's one of the, I was really interested in their family as much as, you know, um, sort of begin with their family, partly because they're coming out of this, like, I mean, in some ways it's a very traditional, you know, immigrant story of this, you know, very driven family who kind of identifies, um, you know, the sort of like tried and true American dream, like hard work, is you know the pathway to success and the parents i mean i believed them they were like we didn't care if they played basketball you know we just care that they mowed the lawn with us and you know we're 
outstanding people and did their homework and were president of student council and, you know, all this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh. And, you know, and, and, and the one, and on the one hand, it was really kind of amazing because I was hearing this and I was hearing like th these, these, you know, women now, but girls growing up were, you know, obviously under an extreme amount of pressure to succeed. On the other hand, it wasn't actually like a unifocal pressure, you know, they were sort of just under pressure to be like good people. And they all happened to be fantastic basketball players. Um, but, you know, it was very clear from her mother, you know, that she would, they would have been just as like happy had they, had she actually become a doctor. Um, you know, and I think that, that there's actually some, an important lesson to be learned. You know, there was a, a book that did very well recently, um, Range. Yeah. You know, oh, he's the show. Yeah. He's yeah. Okay, great. So, um, you know, one thing he doesn't really talk about is, but I think th that is true is that doing a lot of different things also gives you a lot of opportunities to lose. <laughs> You know, I mean, in addition to developing <laughs> skills and all these other things, like you actually have to become resilient in certain ways because you're not always going to be, um, you know, the very best thing. And you also sort of learn that like, oh, it's not, not everything depends on this one aspect of yourself. Like if you fail on this one thing, not everything is over for you. You know, you have, you have a kind of like standing in the world and it's sort of responsibility to yourself to sort of, um, you know, do right by yourself, you know, and there are different kind of avenues to do that. So that was one of the things I was sort of taking from her, but yeah, she's amazing. And she has a kind of, um, like, I think really kind of, I've been thinking a lot about this idea. I've written about this in the context of baseball, but this idea about humility, you know, and in, in particularly in the context of sports and knowledge and stuff like epistemological humility versus like, you know, just kind of, you know, a guard against arrogance, but both are really important right now, I think, in this I'm moment. sorry, I'm, what do you mean by epistemology? Like, there's a lot, there's, a, there's just like a lot we don't know, right? Yeah. We have to be like very yeah, honest <laughs> about the fact that there's so much we don't know and we have to sort of like, you know, be open to identifying with those things instead of clinging to what we do know and just like holding onto those things. It's like life raft, like, well, I know this, you know, um, you know, sort of like be more interested in the things that we don't know you know, and sort of understand that, that the way to progress is through asking questions about what we don't know, instead of just kind of, you know, be, having our blinders on. And, um, but I also think that alongside that, there's a kind of sh something that she embodies in a really important way is that, you know, you, you sort of have to be, know when to choose your spots and you have to sort of um, know that it's not all about yourself. And, you know, in the end, like she has tremendous individual success, but, you know, the path that she takes is a very kind of selfless one um, in a very sort of like efficient methodical way um, that I think is actually like a really important model for us right now because we don't have a lot of those models. I thinking so much about this dinner. Um, for some reason I was invited to this like big wigs sports dinner where the goal was to like sort of black tie celebrate Lance Armstrong before his real disgrace. And I sat at some table with strange men um, who were like, I, I really felt this like profound like desperation really just like the narrative had to be that there was a magical element known as being a winner and that this man possessed it. And like whatever he said was going to be like some extraterrestrial advice or something, right? And like, and I just felt like, I don't know, to me reading your NECA story or to me there are lots of role models now who are just sort of like, I don't think she's fragile at all. <laughs> right? Like, I think she could jump out of a plane in whatever country and be fine, right? And sort things out and be reasonable and humble and, oh, there's a dog. Um, and uh, I don't know, to me, like, it just seems so much stronger to be two feet on the ground kind of thing. And um, something about that that I don't understand seems to me like why you, white fragility is the other recommendation <laughs> for your book, right? There's something about like, are we assessing things as they really are? Or are we like clinging to some fiction okay. that's important to us? You know, one, this is, uh, this is not, you know, quite, this doesn't quite take off from this point, but I, when I was watching The Last Dance, I actually had the thought, like, the further I went, I was like, is this a loser story? <laughs> in some ways. I mean, there's, there's a way in which, like, the Michael Jordan, we can all agree, is, like, in some ways, the ultimate winner, right? I mean, whether or not he is the ultimate winner, you know, by numbers or whatever, the greatest of all, uh, all time, he is sort of this icon of success. And watching that, I mean, it's, and, and that is a, like the, the story of the, history is written by the winners. Like that is his story about winning. Literally, literally, literally. the story. Yeah. But there are, you know, by the end of it, I started to think, I started to think like, there's so much 
missing here, you know, in some ways. There's so much that I, you know, his family, you know, there's so many kind of like aspects of him that seem unfulfilled. I mean, and that's the famous part of it, right? Like he's, he's restless. He's kind of a, you know, kind of a jerk. He's like famously a jerk. I mean, he's all this kind of never satisfied. And there, there's this way in which I'm like, these things don't always break down, you know, in the ways that, that we traditionally assume they will. Yeah. When he's like, oh, I struggle, I struggle. Basically, the sports media was like, nah. Yeah. <laughs> well, first, there's like that famously Freudian piece of his father. Right. And the baseball. Yeah. And like, I'm always like, even to Luis's point, like, that's just about Jordan. I'm like, that's fascinating. Like, yeah, the Bulls, like, that's cool. That's great. But like, he's got all these other layers to it. And I don't know. I, it's amazing to think that like, and Michael Jordan can think he, you know, was a loser because of, you know, and then he suffered this loss with his father. And like, I don't know. It's all, we're all in our own heads a bit. We're all in a giant computer simulation now anyway, so. That's handy. Yeah, it makes it easier. Right there and what the, rest the, of the baseball is. aspect of it, though, is great because that goes right into uh, what your book's about and what we're talking about is he was losing. He, first of all, baseball is, is a loser sport. If you hit three of 10, if you get hit three times in 10, you're only 30%, but you're pretty much a Hall of Famer, right? If you can do it over the course of a number of years. And he wasn't very good, but he, he's told this story, and I've talked to people being in, that, in the business of basketball that knew him well then. And they said he definitely changed in terms of being a teammate. He still wasn't anyone's dream teammate, but he was much, much better when he saw these young guys who uh, were so good to him. And, and he was trying to take their job, and he knew that. And the other thing is, and they, they, they didn't go into it very much detail, but he got to be ended up being a decent baseball player, not the first year, but the second year before the lockout ended, uh, he was doing well in the fall instructional league in Arizona with very, very good future Major League Baseball players. Of course, he was older. Uh, he had a resilience to him. It, 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 we, we get caught up in the air part of it, but there was a resilience. He is famous for talking about the number of misses he had. And, and Henry is famous for, and y'all may not know this, but when Kobe had the brand of the next Jordan, Mr. Clutch, it, we knew the data suggesting that he wasn't even close to being in the top 90. He wasn't in the top 90 this particular season in, in terms of clutch production. And Henry wrote about that. Like, let, let's be fair. This is what he has done, but this is what he is doing. And, and I, Kobe knew. He knew the truth. It just didn't matter. He, th there's, you know, there was, for whatever you want to call it, he was not, wasn't afraid to miss those shots. He knew that when he made it, it's all that mattered for his brand, even though a bunch of other times he didn't. Uh, you, you ha resilience certainly is part of it. And it's a learned thing. But too many times, if you're not Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant and you miss, you don't get that resilience because you get piled on and you just stop. The fear, the fear gets to you. That's what we want to avoid as coaches. We want to create an environment where our people can fail and just continue to work and dream bigger. That's all. He's a loser right now uh, as an NBA owner. Like Oh, Jordan. Yeah. Oh, they're the yeah. worst. They, they're the worst franchise. Them and the Kings are the worst franchise in the league, for yeah. sure. Sorry. He's still making money, though. I have a question yeah. for you as coaches. Yeah. How do you sort of condition your athletes to accept and even embrace losing and learn from losing by, like, not focusing on success and yet hold out the, you know, hold out the um, tantalizing truth that if you can do that, then you'll be more successful? <laughs> you know, I mean, there's a sort of, like, tension between – I mean, I, I – I was, I'm really interested in this tennis player, um, Simona Halep, who's another person I've written about. And she's, we talked a lot about how she had this obsession with losing and it stopped her from winning. You know, she was so, it, losing was so painful that she would get to the, you know, French Open final. She would get to the Australian Open final. She just couldn't cross the line because it was just this like huge mental hurdle. And it was only once she started, you know, really kind of like, enjoying the game. I mean, all these kind of, in some ways, cliches, but she was really living them, you know, sort of appreciating, like just being on the court and, and not putting too much pressure on herself. She won the French Open and then she was extremely happy. And then the question was, was she too happy? And she goes out and completely blitzes Serena Williams. I mean, but how do you convince yourself, <laughs> you know, that you can only win if you don't care too much about losing? I mean, how do you sort of, is it like a trick or is it, how I mean, do I, I get, I don't think there's any one way. I can tell you what I do. I, I, I deal with this all the time. And Bruce was talking to someone about it yesterday, who was actually Caleb, who's on our show. He's applying uh, 
he's trying to get a, a head a coaching job. And we talked about how to nail the interview down. And, and so we talked about, you, he asked kind of the same question. He thinks it's going to be asked more or less what you were just uh, saying, Louisa. And so what I tell my athletes is the, the NBA is such an impossible league to succeed in, kind of like life, that it's a roller coaster. Stop treating it as a roller coaster. Stop riding the ups and downs and find joy in the merry-go-round. It just goes round and round. But there's, there's a way to enjoy that too, which is really more about just embracing the process. And so if you embrace that process and really define it and plan it with discipline, you're going to find plenty of joy day to day. So what you were just talking about, her response after winning the Open was then to beat Serena, you deal with failure the same way you deal with success, back on the merry-go-round the next day. You don't want to be crazy about it like some of these college coaches who win the National Football Championship, then they stay up at the four in the morning uh, texting recruit. That to me is a little bit extreme, uh, but it's worked for them. Get on the roller coaster. You're going to get too many ups and downs. Ride the merry-go-round, find joy in that, and you'll end up building a career. Same thing as in a marriage, as a parent, or in life. Enjoy that merry-go-round. That, that's the speech I give anyway. I am... I'm not a coach, <laughs> just to be very clear. <laughs> but I'd say, I mean, to me, basketball is so great because it's like, you know, whatever. Damian Lillard is now the man who's like seen as the clutch guy or whatever, right? But I mean, that moment the ball comes off your fingertips, like nobody knows what the hell's gonna happen, right? right? Like it's, it's it's stupid. It's like rolling dice in the casino. It's like you're not like you know, at some point you've done all your work at this moment, but that's whether right. it's actually gonna go in, that's totally beyond you, right? So to me, there's like this. Um, I always think about this uh, uh, college semester in Tibet thing I did in 93, where like you end up hanging around a lot of Tibetan llamas and like there's a lot of like, oh, this will be interesting. Like, you know, we'll see what happens here, right? Like the stakes are mega high, but it's like, well, it'll be neat. Like, you know, if it bounces off, then I'll get to learn all those things. And if it goes in, then I'll learn all those things. And either way, it's kind of neato. And like, it's, you know, I try to tell myself that when I'm like driving on the ice or whatever. Right? It's like, well, what? Well, well, We'll try to do our best. <laughs> that, just real quickly, uh, I wanted to tell the story about Lon Kruger, who's a very famous uh, basketball coach for Oklahoma. He was my mentor when he was at the University of Florida. And when his son was eight years old, his son Kevin uh, was at a basketball camp, and Lon and I were sitting up in the bleachers at the big O'Connell Center where the Gators play. And the camp's court was – there were three courts going on because it was smaller courts because there were young kids playing. So he and I are sitting there by ourselves just talking. I'm in my 20s at this point. And Kevin's, Kevin's team – uh, he, he gets fouled. They're down one with no time on the clock. He gets fouled shooting a game winner. Buzzer goes off and misses, but he got fouled. So he gets two free throws. And I'm, I'm nervous for this eight-year-old in a playoff game at camp. And I look at Coach Kruger, his son, and uh, this is his first born, he, uh, first, uh, his oldest son. He says, uh, well, this will be interesting. So I'm wondering what's going on in, in Lon's head. So Kevin misses the first free throw, and then he misses the second free throw. And he is the head coach of University of Florida's son, on their court, and I look at Coach Kruger, and he looks at me with a very kind of a stern face, says, oh, this will be interesting to see how he handles uh, practice tomorrow in the driveway. And I've never forgotten that as a dad, that those are the best moments. The mis mistake you'd make as a father or a coach is to put too much emphasis on those missed free throws. He's eight years old. It is not a suggestion of his character at all. Just like it is isn't if you're 24 or 25, as Henry says, you do your job every day in practice, once you let it go in a game, you let it go. It's like anything, right? You don't know how it's going to happen. Things, things happen whether we prepare for it or not, sometimes in unexpected ways. But how they inform what you do, and that really changed my career as a young coach, is to think about things that way and not assign, oh, he's a winner or he's a loser because he missed two free throws when he was eight years old. And Kevin's now a, big, a college coach himself and had a great college career, actually, and, as a basketball player. Mary, how did you feel after getting fourth? Do you remember high school? Um, like garbage, but it's okay because then, you know, I, I mean, I was like one of those kids. So I grew up in the track and field capital of the world. So like- Where's you know, that? Like Eugene, Oregon. So oh yeah, of course, right. You go on the running trail. I was just doing this yesterday and you're like, like on a trail and you're like, God, I'm slow. And then you're like, oh, that's an Olympian. Like so the <laughs> group is so, I mean, this is where Nike was founded. So yeah, I right. picked the single worst sport and I was like a chubby, awkward, slow kid. Like, and I grew up in a football house. So, you know, that wasn't, my brother was a lineman. So like, I just was, it wasn't my scene. It's okay. I got into college, things worked out. I loved music. I think I really doubled down on music after that, uh, which is probably the right choice. But it's interesting because you guys were 
talking, I was thinking of Sabrina Ionescu, who I've been thinking about a lot here. Yeah. And how she, to me, is this ultimate example of like, so dominant, like what she can control is how she is in the court and just crushes it. She's so fun to watch. And then her career has been snake bitten in these last, this last year or two for reasons that had nothing to do with her talent, right? Like she leads Oregon to the final four. She could have gone to the draft. She's like, you know what? I'm gonna stick around Eugene for my senior year. They probably would have won. COVID wipes out the season. She goes to Liberty. She gets injured. I think she's going to, you know, come back, obviously. She's, right. she's got a whole road ahead of her. But, like, I think that she has handled that with such grace. Like, just that – and, like, you know, Kobe passes away, was a mentor of hers. Like, she, right. to me, is the ultimate example of just, like, so talented, shows up every day, does her job, but, like, has lost so much. You know, she won't get a senior year in college ever again. Like, that's done. You know, Oregon still hasn't won – anyway, I – and I, I find her, you know, I mean, I was a terrible athlete because I was a terrible athlete, but I also think you can be someone like her who is so extraordinary and still lose or still have all these things happen to you. So all things for a reason, I guess, but I wish her a speedy recovery. Seriously. David's been pitching the idea that we should start a podcast, which is basically get athletes to talk about their losses, like just, you know. Their worst loss. Yeah. yeah. Worst loss. Yeah. yeah. They, they, when I talk to my players, it's something I do. When I get to know them, it's something I like to know. I told Henry, it's kind of a way for me to get them to be vulnerable with me. And uh, I, my background's in psychology. And I know how to, if they give me a little bit, I know how to kind of draw more out of them. And then once they do that and, and I'm warm with them, there's a chance I can actually be a, a better mentor or coach to them. But the, the vivid memories they have, these are NBA players typically, of these losses. It might be middle school. It might be AAU championship. It might be just a high school playoff game. Or as I told Henry, some guys, these, all these NBA players are ranked to some degree in their local community first before it's national, right? Because we, we're such in a rush to rank all these athletes when they're eight or nine or 10. And so they might be matched up with the next highest ranked one just below or just above them. And when they get beat, they remember the shot they missed and what their coach said, what their teammates said. It really sticks with them, more so than maybe some of my losses growing up. I wasn't a pro athlete. Uh, yeah, so I think it'd be fun to get them to, and, and also I'd love to talk to <laughs> these players for any sport to the, their opposing coaches who beat them, who have never beaten M- a future NBA or NFL player before. It doesn't have to be basketball. That'd be, that's a hell of a memory, too, when you beat you know, a future a guy that tries to be a great player. Yeah, you now the ball in the chat? I'm proud of it. Yeah, I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, like right. now I feel so differently. I'm like, oh, wow. Like, some of those people went on to D1 scholarships. Like, right, exactly, I- right. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, um, I also think there are different people. One of the things that really interests me about losing is that people handle it so differently. I mean, there's people have such different temperaments. Like my husband was a professional athlete. He's retired and um, he is so much more competitive than I am. And he, um, we play chess a lot and he went, he's won 99% of the games we've played, but he can replay the entire, every single time I've beaten him. Wow. I couldn't tell you a single thing. Yeah. Like what opening I used, whatever, you know, maybe vaguely remember the, some of the more exciting finishes. He can actually sit down a chessboard or just, you know, say like, yeah, D4, D5, you know, he could just sort of, he can replay every single game from three years wow. ago, you know, because it just like is imprinted on him, you know? And I think that that's like, insane, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Does he not remember his wins? No. I mean, wow. partly because he wins too much. But I mean, he remembers, I mean, he has a very, very, very good memory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that there's something to that, that some people, um, and particularly probably athletes or very successful people, do have a kind of like, one of the ways in which they learn from defeat is, you know, it's like they learn, you know, they stick their hand on a hot, you know, hot, uh, pot you know and they and they learn not to do that you know they sort of it stays with them in a way that like you know i learned to move on and others are exactly the opposite you know they sort of learn to just like turn the page and just you know move on immediately i mean it's sort of there are different ways to successfully you know learn from and overcome a loss but it is interesting how different people do it i'm guessing louise that you got amazing grades in school I, I do remember, so yes, I did. <laughs> okay, so this, I, I remember my B in school. I got a B, I got a B plus on an exam in college. And I started crying when I got it back from the TM. 
And she was so shocked that I was crying that I made up a story about how my boyfriend had just broken up with me. I was so oh, no. <laughs> And then she's comforting me, you know, she's hugging me, you know. It's trauma. It's trauma. It's traumatic, you know. In the chat, um, Bilal, who's a doctor in England, said he remembers every B he ever got, which I thought was funny. And then Judy said, my mom remembers my <laughs> <laughs> that's another part of this story that we haven't really we haven't i don't i'm not sure that enough like parent stories in, in this in this volume you know there's a there's a second volume to be written <laughs> my child the loser exactly yeah, we get the loser um so towards the end of the show we like to bring in gerard hector it's like our tradition here and he always has better questions than we have um and he might be in paris let's see let's see how that looks oh there we go. Oh, <laughs> wow. Aren't you getting bored there, Gerard? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. You there, know. Are other, there are other great cities in Europe, you know. <laughs> there are. Barcelona's one of my favorites. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are a lot of really awesome cities in Europe. Paris, Paris is my favorite, though, number one. Um, Louisa and Mary, this is, I haven't obviously read the book yet, and, and I want to. When you were doing work around this, and of course, thank you guys for, for joining us. Um, how much of the research, whether like actually like doing numbers and data versus like talking to people or a combination of both, did you find between this idea of why sports resonate so much because it kind of fits with how our brains work, right? Like we like dichotomies and we like to simplify things very easily. Win, loss, fat, skinny, ugly, pretty, like it's just, that's just what we do. And then juxtapose that with sort of like the reality that to a point you made earlier that life is lived in the losses, right? Like that's, that's where all the real stuff happens. It's like in that gray, uncertain, but like no one likes to be there, right? Like no one likes to be in that murky, I don't know what this is area. Um, what, what did you guys find in your, in your research and your work on that part? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think like one of the things I love about Luisa's writing and just I think how some of our favorite writers who contributed to this approach things is that stories aren't black and white, right? There's a whole bunch of gray. And so the same way, you know, if Michael Phelps wins a race, whoever writes that story is gonna talk about his stroke and deconstruct how he won. I feel like we wanted to apply that same methodology to losing. It's just a taboo, right? I mean, it's, it's a taboo topic and that excited me actually more. And we sent out that original email to just kind of our list of dream contributors um, before I think we even sold the book, it was a while ago, just like floating this idea and immediately got responses from people that were, many of which ended up in the final collection, which indicated that we were get like, people saw it the same way we did, that there was more texture to it than just you lost, that's it. So, I mean, I don't know, Louisa, if you agree with that, but like, I think that that it, it lends itself to that. It's just, it's raw, dark, you know, territory for athletes or writers to have to dig into. I think also one of the things we talked about early on, and I'm, I'm really actually proud of, um, you know, that we were able to do this was that we wanted a really kind of uh, like rich variation on losing. So there are collections in here that, you know, there's, there's a guy who grew up in Boston who was terrible at sports growing up. Like, I mean, his, the passages about him, you know, playing Little League and, you know, the, the lone goal he ever scored are some of my favorite, you know, like pages of the book. But then there are also, you know, there's a story about LeBron. Um, there's a story about, um, you know, there's some like very funny pieces or some that are like really tragic pieces. Louisa Hollow, we talked about before, you know, wrote about her grandparents who both owned rain, racehorses and her grandfather was abusive. I mean, it sort of really runs the gamut of, in terms of tone, um, texture, in terms of how we define loss. Um, you know, there's loss of, loss of a father, loss of a sports team that, you know, that you root for, loss of childhood. I mean, there's sort of all these things that sort of manifest in our obsession with winning and losing on a field or, you know, on a court or whatever. And, um, we wanted to sort of like represent the full range of that. And um, I hope we, you know, I hope we went some way to doing that, but we did want to make sure that we were sort of um, defining losing at both as broadly as possible, but without, um, without kind of like, you know, losing the integrity of it too. Like, I mean, there is something we can identify as loss and as losing. And that is, I think, one of the reasons, I think you're right, we're drawn to sports because losing is so like um, identifiable, right? <laughs> we can agree there's a clear winner and there's a clear loser and there's 
there's kind of like rituals around it for how we're supposed to sort of um, acknowledge that and act and, and, and that teaches us a lot about who we are as a society. I think there's like a, um, you go to work and let's say you work in marketing and you have four meetings and you try to get this agenda forward and blah, blah. And then you come home and you don't, and your wins are just gray. Everything's gray, right? Like, did you win today? Well, you'll never know, right? Um, but then you, when you go home and turn on the TV, it's fun to have like clarity, right? <laughs> like, it's a, like it, but it's hypnotizing, right? That like, it doesn't mean the truth is actually uh, black and white. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel like this, what we're all stuck in this sports journalist, but just like, no, 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 the truth of what actually happened is like way complicated. Like, it's also true. I mean, even in sports, like, you know, we talk about how random it can be, you know, and one of the reasons to focus on the process is, you know, I mean, Kawhi Leonard hits a shot against the 76ers. And then the, the entire narrative of the NBA is like now set in concrete. Right. And it's sort of, I mean, and we can all acknowledge that, you know, had like, I don't know, the air conditioner like, <laughs> malfunctioned and the draft like changed and maybe, you know, a balance went one millimeter this way. And, and, you know, it's a completely, completely different story. And yet we put, we impart so much meaning onto something that we can all acknowledge, you know, intellectually is, is essentially almost random or maybe even as random, you know? Um, so I think that, you know, that does also show how much we want to, um, yeah, we want clear explanations for things. We want narrative. We're, we're narrative creatures, human beings are, you know. Tom Habershow did this research where like, you know, if every, every team shoots a certain percentage on average, right? And so you, you just from randomness would expect them to, like a certain chunk of the NBA season is just that, right? Like, like they won this game because they happened to be a night, they made more of the same shots that they lost that they missed the other day. And like, but there's never been a game story that was like, ah, it's just a... There was no story. <laughs> like, we just can't write it that way. Um, great. Well, listen, uh, thank you both so much. Um, is there anything else you want to add? Any like favorite parts of the book you want to highlight or uh, before we go? Oh my gosh, all of them. Uh, well, we kind of consider Gay to They're Least all patron. They're all winners. Oh. All winners and losers. We consider Gay to Least like the patron saint of the genre. Like he has been a big loser advocate before it was before it was cool. And so he, we have a Floyd Patterson piece, which I love. Um, what else? We have everything. We have a really we bizarre take, take title from him. Essentially, he wrote this piece called "The Loser" about yeah. this boxer who um, kind of famous. And and I mean that piece. He has a quote in it. Um, I think we took it as our draft, but um, you know that losing it's in losing that re, you know reveals who you are. And I think that that is true. I mean, in part because, especially with these like public victories, you know, everybody sort of is there with you. Losing isn't can be intensely like private and personal, and you're sort of faced with yeah, like. What next? How am I going to handle this? How am I going to move on? You know, it's, um, I think it's a really important thing for, for all of us to sort of ask ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And this yeah. summer we're all kind of losers, it turns out. So we didn't know that when we, you know, set the proofs off. But and we are stuck on the merry-go-round, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. If you can't embrace it now, you're never. <laughs> <laughs> this is good practice. Is your dog still there, Mary? Uh, he's sleeping in the corner. Sorry. Don't take it personally. He... No, that's all right. Just wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, thank you guys so much. Uh, thank you, Gerard. Thank you, David. Thank you, Louisa. Thank you, Mary. And uh...